My name is uh, Nasratullah Gafuri. I'm a PhD candidate in cryptography in Osaka University here in Japan. And I would be uh, uh, the moderator uh, for this session. So welcome to exhibit track. And the uh, next presenter is uh, Arnaud Monhanba, who is uh, a senior solution consultant and he's also passionate about security and he loves to share his uh, experience. So I'm looking and we are all looking forward to hear from uh, Mr. Arnold. And if you have any question, uh, please post it by uh, Hua. And the chat functionality is not working, I think, for the uh, participants. So please use the Hua uh, platform to post your questions and we have 10 minutes at the end of the session for q a and mr arnold will have uh, 45 minutes to present his very nice speech arnold over to you thank you thank you very much Nasra. um so thank you guys for, for joining us for this session um i wanted to have this session very practical uh, so in fact what we're going to do today is to kind of discuss uh some of the the basics of the different topics. Uh, and then what I will try to do is to jump in and show you a demo of a specific use case and how we can have a solution for that specific use case. Um, so today the talk is, all, is gonna be about how you can use infrastructure as a code to accelerate your thread modeling process. So we'll discuss some of the challenges around those and let me just show uh, the, the calendar. Um, so typically here today we're gonna do a quick intro into uh, infrastructure as a code, but it's not gonna be by no means a full training on, uh, on this kind of platform. We kind of discuss what it is, the good thing about it, the benefits. Um, then we'll discuss about threat modeling and how we do automated threat modeling. Uh, and one of the topic that will then be uh, seen is, you know, how do we actually use both technology or both methodology to actually be able to accelerate your threat modeling process. Uh, and then I'll jump in and show you a live demo. Uh, and with that live demo, you'll be able to see uh, some use cases, some of the problem uh, that we have and how we address those problems to accelerate your threat modeling process. Okay. So with no further ado, I will start with a very quick introduction to uh, infrastructure as a code. And all I can say that this is a, a great thing to have, right? So what does it actually do? So let's have a look at the definition uh, from Wikipedia. Well, infrastructure as a code is a process of managing and providing computer data center through uh, machine readable de definition files rather than the physical configuration or interactive configuration of tools. So what does that actually mean? Uh, well, it's to put this very simply, you can take a configuration file that we have here, uh, which is a descriptive file of an infrastructure, and this will help to deploy your whole infrastructure. So as an example, uh, at Eris Risk, whenever we want to deploy um, a customer tenant in the cloud, well, we use a cloud formation script, which makes it very easy for us to deploy this. And we can make, uh, it is very repeatable. So we can deploy any other customers by using the same template uh, and so on. So you can see all of the good, nice world around, you know, what is that infrastructure as a code actually brings, right? So it is scalable, it's automated, um, you know, it's, uh, pretty efficient and very uh, uh, good for repeating different tasks that you have internally. So there are many tools uh, that we can use and depending on the environment, the cloud environment that you use, uh, you can use the different tools. Uh, so some of the most famous ones, CloudFormation uh, on AWS. And you know, a lot of people are also starting to move into Terraforms. So these are the two that we'll talk about today and how we can use those ones to be able to deploy infrastructures and make sure that those infrastructures are secure, okay? Um, the next topic that I'm gonna talk about, and it is something that I'm kind of talking on a daily basis because this is what we kind of uh, have as a product, is threat modeling and how we do threat modeling. So I'm gonna jump to the next slide. And again, we're gonna have a look at a definition and probably I will explain a little bit more about what we do here in this kind of exercise. So threat modeling, again, is another process in which we're trying to find out potential threats 
uh, such as structural vulnerabilities and the essence, essence of uh, appropriate safe world. And they cannot be identified, they can be enumerated, and the countermeasure can be prioritized. So typically in this exercise, we try to anticipate some of the threats at design phase. A um, lot, lot of reasons to actually do that at design phase. And as you can see here, we have a chart that shows, well, if you find something at the design stage, well, obviously it is cheaper to fix than waiting uh, for these uh, threats to actually appear in your release stage. A um, lot of reason for that. Typically you need to go through different uh, steps, remediation boards, probably the application has already been hacked. So probably there's a certain cost associated to be, you being hacked and so on. So the best practice is actually to have a look at your design and try to find out of the uh, design flows there. Um, so what's automated threat modeling brings you is that it helps you to automate uh, the risk um, and the threat finding process. So we can automatically generate some risk patterns. It will reduce the time of completion of a threat model. So if you ever done a threat model manually, it might take you 30 days to actually do that. Using the tool will reduce that time to, for example, days or hours, uh, and you can leverage different uh, techniques like templating and so on. It will increase the collaboration between different teams because here, a lot of teams can work together. So developers can start uh, building the threat model uh, or security architects, and then the security team can come in and help them and see what are the different security that they need to complement. When you use, you use a, an automated tool, uh, because it is automated, um, the uh, results are always consistent. It doesn't depend on the user's uh, experience. So if I do a threat model and a junior engineer does a threat model, obviously we'll have some differences. Uh, but using an automated tool actually will uh, make sure that we don't have, we have a consistent result all the time. Okay, so a lot of more um, um, benefits to using automated threats, uh, modeling tools. Uh, and typically what we now try to do is to figure out really what is the link between those two technologies that we'll talk about here today. Um, so let me jump into the next slide. So typically the way we work uh, with threat modeling, and this is how uh, we do the image risk, uh, which is a tool for automated day, automating your threat model. Typically we'll start with some kind of uh, diagramming tool. So we use uh, in our platform, we use uh, Jordan.io uh, from the diagramming perspective. And we also use some kind of questionnaire that can help you to bring more details to that threat model. Then the next thing, Iris Risk or the automated tool will generate those things that could go wrong. Uh, once they have generated those things that could go wrong, they also suggest, you know, what are the remedi remediation steps? What could you do to actually go and fix those issues that you find within your threat model? Uh, the next thing is once you have all of that recommendation, well, we need to see actually, do actually people care to actually go and implement what we actually provided to them. So the way we can do things here now is to go and track uh, with issue trackers, you know, the security issue that we send them to JIRA, to Azure DevOps, and then see if they actually implement it. So we can track uh, with a two-way sync, those kind of vulnerabilities. Okay, so this is great. And this is helping us to find very early some threats. Well, if you now combine uh, the two approach using um, the infrastructure as a code, well, one of the benefits of that, and I will show you in a typical example whenever I jump into the product. Well, you could design some infrastructure as a code templates and deploy things, but they're not secure. Well, if you do threat loading on those infrastructure as a code, well, you're able to find those threats even before the application or the platform is deployed. Uh, and so also avoiding you know, the cost of remediation. Um, the infrastructure as a code helps threat modeling whenever you don't have a diagram available. And I'll show you an example of, of that a little on today. Um, Sometimes it could be too time consuming to actually draw a complete infrastructure in the screen, or probably uh, you, know, you don't actually know what's behind your infrastructure. So having uh, the IEC template will actually help you. Um, the infrastructure as a code also helps you to automate the diagramming without actually having uh, a, a, a human inter interactions, you know, having and taking out the human errors out of the, uh, the equation. So if you look back at the diagram, at the uh, 
uh, previous screen I was showing you well, this is how we build the first step. So showing to Iris Risk or to the platform what we're building. So prior, uh, before we used to use uh, the diagramming tool. And with the diagramming tool, we were able to draw the diagram. This time, what we're able to do is to take Terraforms or cloud formation to be able to provide us some information about the, uh, the platform that you're going to be building. Then we can also use a, um, a model that we call the open model, open flip model, uh, which will allow you to describe your infrastructure into the text format. And in fact, the two other ones, Terraforms and CloudFormation import, will actually use that as an intermediate step. So this is how we will then be able to take those diagrams, make sure that we have as many information that we, as we need for our threat model, and we'll be able to deploy that and we'll be able to see the threats for those different infrastructure. So in the next step, what we'll see is that now we have a very simple three-step process in order to use uh, this uh, threat model and to use uh, infrastructure as a code. So typically to what you would do, uh, the first step will, well, do like you normally do, create your uh, infrastructure as a code template. Then you can upload those templates to our platform. Then our platform will generate the threats and will create the tickets for the relevant team. And this could be fully automated, right? So you could just create it automatically, then you can provide it using the API, uh, and then Ares Risk will generate all the threats that are relevant to uh, the different environments. Okay, so this is how very simple it is done by just using automation, using a couple of API calls, and you'll be able to do that. So it is a very simple uh, process, but in fact, it has a lot of power. Uh, and what I will try to demonstrate is how the whole thing actually ties together and showing you how you do the threat model within the risk risk, and then how you'll be able to import those different uh, diagrams into Iris risk and making sure that you can leverage the different uh, features of the product to be able to track and report on those different threats. So the next thing we're going to jump on the demo. So like I said, this is going to be a very uh, practical example. Uh, and then we can discuss, we can have a lot of questions about uh, whenever I finish this demo. So I'm going to jump into Iris Risk, which is typically a web platform uh, hosted here in the cloud, but can also be hosted in your uh, on-prem environments. And you can log in using different login mechanisms. Okay. So as you can see here, I've got different projects that I'm going to be able to work on. I can delete projects. I can do a lot of management of those different projects that I'm going to be building. Uh, but I'm going to build a very simple threat model. And I'm going to show you some of the challenges that you'd have if you were to have a very big uh, infrastructure behind your application. So let me go ahead and build a very uh, quick threat model. So here probably I will provide a name. And so typically we use this example here with an S3 bucket uh, that, uh, that has a web UI token to it. We can customize those fields. This is not really the topic of today. But what I'm going to do is to show you that we integrate draw.io in order to do the diagramming. Uh, and then you can have different components. So not only we can use Jodaraio, but you can also import from different other sources if you have other sources for to do your diagramming. And so typically here, I'm going to quickly draw uh, my threat model and being able to generate uh, some of the threats very quickly. So I'm going to build a web UI. And what Iris Chris will do, it will provide me with a component. And this component will contain all the risk pattern that I need to be aware of whenever I build a web UI. So all the security requirements that are needed around a web UI. Then what I'm going to be able to do is to also bring more component, this time from the cloud. Uh, and so I'm going to do that by just doing the search. So I'm going to search for NS3 bucket. And then I'm going to search, for example, for an, RD, an RDS database, let's say. And let me also drop a Lambda function just to make it a bit more interesting. I'm going to spell it all the time. Lambda. 
Okay, so I'm going to drop these different components. And like I said at the beginning, all these different components will have risk pattern assigned to them. So I can even show what are their relationships, and then I can even provide protocol information if I want to. So I'm going to right click here and edit the data flow. And for example, say, well, this is secure network. So let's go ahead and provide it to us here. Um, so here, very quickly, I've built a very basic threat model. Um, if I was doing this manually, this will take me probably a few hours, but here very quickly I was able to do that. And then if you want to find out what are the threats, what are the different risks to this application, if I did it manually, again, it will take me a few hours to actually figure out, you know, what are the threats to a web UI, what are the threats to an S3 bucket and so on. So probably I would have a, uh, an Excel sheet somewhere where I need to copy and paste into two different documents. Here, yeah, everything is done within the same platform uh, and you can have those uh, results very quickly uh, provided here to you. So once it's updated, in fact, you can go and check what are the different security requirements for the different applications or the different component that you have within uh, your page here. So you'll see, for example, on the web UI, you have things that are relevant to how to abuse the privilege, how to use uh, click jacking attacks and so on. So a lot of information, a lot of security requirement that you need to be aware whenever you build uh, a web application. Um, same thing for other type of component that we have here. Uh, we have things relevant, for example, for the S3 bucket. And we've seen sometimes in the news where people have deployed uh, S3 buckets without securing them. So here, what we're providing uh, to uh, our users, is actually uh, things that you need to consider whenever you build or you have an S3 bucket deployed out there in the world. Uh, so here, for example, data could be accidentally deleted or data could be compromised. So what do you need to do? So for example, well, you need to enable backup. How do you enable backup? Well. Typically, you can go in there and see what are the kind of recommendations. So here, your operation team can leverage that as well as your developer that can also leverage uh, the security requirements for your web application that you are building. Okay, so this is great when you have, you know, a, a very simple diagram, right? So this is this was very simple. Well, let's say so from time to time we we speak to customers and they said, hey, you know what? I've got this application that I need to fit model but I do not have a diagram. And probably I don't have anybody that can actually knows how my application actually is in the back end. Um, so what you can leverage here, uh, and if I show you, for example, the way we build our SaaS environment, it is a little bit more complex than the diagram you've just seen. So how do you actually leverage uh, IEC to actually bring that part of my application and then I can leverage that and I can use that. So this is simply by using the cloud formation scripts, okay, or the uh, Terraform script that we're going to be building. So what I'm going to do now is to just uh, show you a very simple example of a uh, cloud formation script that I'm going to build. Um, and I'm going to show you how I can import it into Iris Risk. Uh, so we have uh, this kind of uh, uh, diagrams in created form. Okay. So the role of somebody or your DevOps team or your developer that are trying to provide some kind of a uh, test application well, we'll create a, a cloud formation script. So here, probably you will use some kind of tool like that, or probably from the IP, IDE. Uh, and what I'm going to do here, I'm not going to create it from scratch. I'm just going to open one that I already have somewhere. Uh, and typically, well, I can upload it here. And I can use a local file. And I'm going to use the one that I prepared. That doesn't have much in it, but I just wanted to show you how you can leverage that. So this application looks a bit like uh, the one I've just created manually which has, it has uh, some kind of Lambda function, it has database and so on. And the idea is to take that cloud formation script that I was created here, as you can see below, and then we can import it into Ares Risk. Uh, and by porting this to Ares Risk, you'll be able to see that we're gonna generate the diagram, but we're also gonna generate the threats and the containers that are relevant to each and every component that we see here in the screen. So how do we do that? So again, this is my script in a text file. Uh, what I'm going to now do is to use uh, the API to actually upload uh, that result to uh, the platform. Uh, so we have an API, which is documented on, on, Git, on the uh, Swagger Hub. And this is what it's providing. Well, in order to provide something to Ares Risk, well, you need to use that API. Obviously, you need to some kind of authentication, which I will not going to show, using an API uh, key. And then I need to provide some parameters. So uh, 
if I select a file, so I'm going to select a file that I've just created, uh, which is called ds 3 rlds then what I'm going to be able to do is to use that file to actually do that. So I did it before and I already had the create project created, so we actually gave me an error. But this time I'm going to do it again uh, and be able to send that to Ares Risk. If it was successful, uh, well, the API will return some values. And those values are, well, I created a project. Uh, it is a standard project. It is open. And these are the states that it's actually using. If I now go back to my Ares Risk instance, I will be able to see inside of all my projects, a new project that has been created that was called Cloud Formation Input. So we can go and drill in. And as you can see, all of the different components that I've built in into that section uh, has been added to Ares Risk. I can already see that it has some threats to those different components and also the associated countermeasures that are relevant to that. So what can I do with this? Well, obviously, uh, having created that uh, template before I actually deploy it, I can really quickly check what are the different security requirements that I need to implement. Uh, if I don't implement it myself, I can actually send relevant tickets to the relevant teams. And this is what I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to have a look at the threat model that I created. Go to the diagram, that's what you actually see. And then we can see what are the different uh, components. We can add more if you want it, for example. So, well, this is my infrastructure in the back end, but what is actually that I'm building? So again, like I did earlier, I'm going to add a trust zone. I'm going to add the rest of my application. And then I'm going to say, well, I'm building a web UI once again. And this time, I can also have different things communicating together. So here, again, I've provided this same kind of information, but now I know what are the infrastructure behind it, what are the different components in my infrastructure behind it. So this way I've built uh, my threat model much quicker than I uh, had to earlier, and I know that it's more accurate, and, and I've got all this information about it. Um, so now, if I, I can also update the model, and now what I'm going to do is to be able to send the different information that we have so the relevant team can actually go and fix those. So as you can see, uh, we are kind of accelerated uh, our threat model by providing much more accurate information and that in a, you know, in a, in a few seconds by just using a, a, a script uh, that's run in the background. And obviously, if you modify the script or if your infrastructure is changing, you can actually update that and you will be able to update the threat model that you have here before your eyes. So I'm going to go back to uh, the different threats. And again, I can go through those threats and, and filter what they are. And I can even send those different information to my DevSecOps team. So for example, they, they work in Jira, they work in Azure DevOps. Well, I've done, I've created this S3 bucket. Well, this is what you need to go ahead and go and fix it. So I'm going to create a ticket. And because we have a two-way sync with the ticketing systems, not only we're creating a ticket within our ticketing systems, we're also getting the ticket number and we get an hyperlink. And with that hyperlink, you can then go back uh, to the ticket very quickly. And you can verify the same information that you find within our platform. And obviously, uh, you can work within this ticket and you can do, you can document. So we provide some external links uh, for you to be able to do, to have some references and learn more about what is the problem here at the end. And then obviously, once you finish it, you can put some comments, document what you've done, and then you can close that ticket. So closing that ticket will also close uh, the ticket with any risk. risk. So you, we can track from one way to the other what people are actually do into our threat model and do actually fix these things. So an, a, another uh, use case for that will be how you can uh, have the auditors coming in, looking at an application, and you can show them that you've done the threat model, you find some threats, you were able to provide some uh, fixing and you were able to do that and track those fix that you have actually implemented within the plan. So if I go back to the Iris Risk platform, uh, what is also interesting is that you can provide a roadmap of things that you need to do. So let's say that I need to go and implement my different issues. Well, I can expand my S3 bucket and see what are the kind of countermeasures that I need to apply to that S3 bucket. Um, if I have the tickets, I can actually sync it and see what are the tickets there. 
And, and if there are any tickets, I can actually see them here and I will see if they're being implemented or not. So as you can see here, uh, this ticket was actually uh, created and it was uh, implemented by closing it within, uh, it was within my JIRA tool, okay? So I can also prioritize. So we say that we need to have priority. Well, here I can see the priority and I can actually say, well, let me first work on the highest priority. And so here, straight away, I, need, I see the kind of thing that I need to implement first in order to secure my platform very quickly. I can also see this thing that I need to implement in my application. And that's something that I will be also doing later. But as you can see, all these security uh, countermeasures are available. All the security requirements are available. Your security team can also feed some of those security requirements. So we're flexible, we can also assess from other sources. So the security team can bring some security requirements for you to actually be able to uh, track against those ones. And because this is a web platform, uh, very uh, large groups can actually work on this platform and can provide some security features and uh, provide more security content if they will. So anything that you can see within the platform is customizable. So in fact, if you want it, you could customize the field, you can customize the threats, and so on. So this is how you can easily take a cloud formation script, or you can take a uh, Terraform script, import it into Ares Risk, and speed up the process of doing threat model uh, with this kind of information. There's another way that you could do that, and this is something that uh, there was another talk today by uh, Fraser Scott, one of my colleagues, which was all about OTM. And OTM is just an open threat model, uh, which we provided uh, and people can enrich it, where you can actually describe into a text file, text file how your threat model actually looks like. Uh, and I can show you an example, uh, which is just a text description of a, of a uh, platform. Look, it looks like a uh, cloud formation script and you can just import it within every script and you'll be able to also build uh, Connectors. So let's say that we you don't use cloud formation. Let's say that you use something else instead. Well, you can use uh, the OTM specification to build your own uh, 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 scripts and being able to translate that to, into something that Ares Risk understands. Okay. So once you have uh, created and generated all these threats, we have sent those tickets to the relevant team. Obviously, what will be interesting is to see well, you know, what are the implementation steps that we have actually done what are the different uh, uh, threats that are out there in our threat model. So here, for example, you could go to your portfolio and actually try to understand what are the risk of your different applications? Uh, where are the mitigation efforts that you're actually doing? What are the risks? Uh, what are the inherent risk? And what is the projected risk? Are you actually facing things? So this way you can actually see uh, the thing that actually been done within the enterprise. Um, and for more advanced uh, customer, we do also have analytics module where we can actually create a lot of dashboard and you can query the database to find a lot of relevant information in terms of what we have uh, within the product, okay? So as you've seen, uh, very easily, I was able to generate a cloud formation script uh, from the uh, AWS uh, resource manager and designer. I used that cloud formation script to import it into Ares Risk to fast forward the threat loading uh, process because I didn't know what my platform looks like or I didn't know a, a, a good diagram of my platform. But using that cloud formation script, I was able to get that very quickly and was able to generate a threat model and generate some threats. Having those threats, I was able to see the recommendation and the remediation step that I need to actually implement and then sending it to the relevant team and those different teams will actually work together to close those different tickets that we've seen within the tool. So this is in a nutshell, you know, how we can take this kind of approach to fast forward or to accelerate the threat finding process. And people that are just using, doing uh, provide provisioning of platforms would actually gain by knowing in advance, well, what are the threats before actually deploy? And in fact, in the uh, threat loading world, we will also, also benefit from using those templates to speed up the process of doing this kind of threat model. So this is typically what I, I wanted to show you today. Um, a very specific example, very hands-on. Um, and so probably I will take some questions and see if there's any more topics that you guys would like to discuss uh, and see how we can advance here. 
Uh, so, uh, Nazra, I'm pretty sure that we can open the, the poll or see if there's any questions in the poll. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rod, for a very good uh, presentation. We got a couple of questions, so let me read it actually. Okay. Uh, Joe asked us, I know how good threat modeling management saves me time and anticipate issue from design, but what do you recommend for tracking them? Use Excel files for a manual approach? hybrid using tools such as Confluence or specialized software tools to automate the process. Thanks. Okay. So um, on an almost daily basis, you know, I talk to sports prospects, I talk to customers which who have actually started doing threat modeling using Excel sheets. Uh, and typically what they will tell us is that, well, they cannot scale it, right? You know, we want to do more threat model. We want to do more uh, with less resources, right? Uh, well, Excel sheets will not cut it. It will not help you at all. So uses, using an automated tool, uh, like the one I'm showing you here, will help you to speed up the process. Not only that, but also make sure that you better organize in terms of, hey, how do I share this different information? Well, I don't need to send a PDF file. Everybody can log into the platform with different uh, permissions. And so, for example, uh, a specific role might just be interested in seeing dashboard, but not the specific threats or what people are doing on those threats. And some people might be more interested in that. So using this kind of platform, I think for me anyway, it's a better uh, uh, way to do it, helps you to scale. So if you look in the enterprise, most of the time you would have one or two security guys or maybe more, but you have hundreds of developers. Uh, so if you use this kind of tool, you can actually try and shift left, you know, having the developer or the security architect starting to do this work. And as you see, joining the diagram is very easy. So they can even leverage the icon from somebody else. Thank you. So uh, just, I hope uh, you have got the answer, but still, if you have, if you need clarification, please post your question, I will read it. So the second question is, it says, does IRIS risk also scan the IEC or ICE files for possible misconfiguration? or does it only scan for resources and bring up a static list of security vulnerabilities and corresponding controls? Okay, so right now, where we started, we're actually only looking at the threats for the different components, but this is where we wanna go. We wanna make sure that we also look at configuration and we can provide some information around those different configuration well ahead of time. And in fact, you can build those rules. Uh, so I didn't talk about the rule engine, but if customers already had uh, some of those specifications, they can actually build rules to actually say, hey, uh, you're building a, uh, a cloud application and you have a, a web server talking directly externally. Well, this, this is not really good. Well, I can actually create a rule that will flag that this is not a proper configuration within my, uh, within my thread model. Thank you very much. Uh, the third, third question is like, do you think the application developers are responsible for the security? Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, I think we had, a, we had a, a, a talk a while ago where we kind of asked this question where we have developers against you know, security teams and who should do what, right? Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, and I've been doing so for a while. So I used to sell uh, static code analyzer, right? So looking at security for your static code and trying to figure out who's responsible. Again, it is a shared responsibility because everybody is involved within the security lifecycle of an application. Uh, developers will be the one that introduce security issues. So obviously, whenever there's a security issue, they are the one that will have to fix it. Uh, so if you did it well from the beginning, then you don't have to fix things. But also, you know, security team are responsible because they are the one, whenever there's a security issue, they're the one that'll be, you know, uh, back and forth to actually try and fix it. Uh, but in help with the developers. So if you're trying to break the gap between the developers and the different teams, if you bake security, team, security into your life cycle, this is what you know, people actually recommend. This is the best way to improve the posture of your application in terms of the security of those applications. I think so. I think it's a shared responsibility. It's never Absolutely. like a security engineer or security advisor responsibility. And, but there was always a gap, right? So I started yeah. uh, application testing about 13 years ago. 
And I used to go around and you know find vulnerabilities in applications. And people will tell me, well, this is you know application the uh, the developers are responsible. The developers will tell us, well, no, the uh, uh, the security team is responsible because they just need to put a firewall. And in fact, when you look at it, no, it is an application vulnerability. So you need to do some kind of coding behind it. So the developers will have to do that. Security will not know how to code your application. So again, depending on what the vulnerability shows up, it might be for security or it might be for, uh, uh, for the development. So now we have new technologies where people are saying, well, now I can put a web application firewall. And again, this is another very interesting uh, topic where you know, we can argue, hey, if I put a firewall, firewall in, in front of an application, well, I can fix this application completely for security bugs. Uh, well, yes, this is good, but what if your firewall doesn't work very well? Or what if uh, at some point there's an issue with your firewall, then your application becomes again vulnerable? So it can buy you some time, but again, you have to go back and put your application and make sure that you secure it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so the next question is like, do you think it's a good idea to outsource the threat modeling of the application or do you think it's better to do it inside the company or, or any industry? Well, to be fair, I don't have any, um, any preferences. Again, it will really depends on, do you have the capacity to actually do it internally? Uh, if you don't, well, probably you can outsource it, but then who do you outsource it to? Do you associate it to the people that are actually building your code? Probably not a good idea. Uh, but if they're doing the thing uh, in the correct way, probably they can show you proof that they've done things correctly. So we've seen uh, more and more uh, SIs actually being able to show we've done threat modeling on the application before we actually build it. And we can show you what we've done around the threat that we found early. So um, external guys can actually show you that they did a good job. Right? So again, uh, it could be either, to be fair. But I would prefer to do internally for my own application if I've got the resources to do it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Maybe the probably the, <clears throat> the last question. Uh, the question is: Should we use cloud infrastructure kind of for risk, or maybe high threat modeling? So, can you repeat that question? Sorry. So, so the question is: Should we use the uh, cloud infrastructure scanner for risk, or the IAC, or we call the high threat modeling? Well, I'm not quite sure which one you should you should use, right? So, you know, security has, has always been like a kind of a, an onion ring, right? So you can always add more layers uh, to whatever you do, right? So, you know, it's like people will tell me, hey, if I do threat nodal, should I still do pen testing? Uh, should I still do source code analysis? Uh, and so the answer is normally yes. And again, it depends on your resources. Uh, and so, you know, whatever works, for you or for your organization, uh, I believe this is uh, the best way to actually do that. Uh, because some organization will try to do threat modeling and it will take them a long, long time to actually do it. Some organization will just choose to do pen testing and they will live with that. And, uh, but you know, we've seen more and more people starting with threat modeling. So shifting left really the responsibility, uh, making sure that uh, applications are designed with security in mind. And even if you look at uh, the OAP top 10, uh, that was just released well last year, or I can't remember when it was released. Well, there's a new session being introduced, which was insecure design, right? So even in the top 10, we kind of, you know, not just thinking about cross site scripting or input validation, we're also thinking about, hey, you should look how you design your application and make sure that you bake security inside of that secure design as well. So uh, um, threat loading is you know, something that is coming and that's, you know, that's the HST, uh, I believe. Orna, thank you very much. It was such an impressive, informative presentation. Thank, thank you very you. much for your time. So let's wrap up this session. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So there was one thing in the chat, so I didn't see it. Oh, very good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so it's just me. Okay, cool. I keep it thank short, you, but it's fine. Okay, all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much. You did great. Yeah, thank you. Very much. <laughs>
but I can't get it to work. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess so. I just can't get it to work on this. I actually like can't find settings in my computer, so that could be it. Where do you find settings? Each number. See, there is this number. Five. No, this one. Three. Three. No. There's a three and a zero. See, I can't find the zero. But it's an O and a three, right? Yes. The zero comes first, which means it's three. If it was a three, then a zero, it would be 30. A three and a zero. <laughs> yes. Not my fingers. Why? What's wrong? Why? Because. They smell like chocolate. Hmm. You don't smell like chocolate. Where are you going? You got a buzz? Yeah, uh, and, and I really have to go party. Well, go party, you silly girl. I'm gonna poop on your head. Got three 
Zero zero. Yeah, one one zero ten. Did you go potty? Yeah. You have a little bit of glitter all over you. You even have it in your hair. What? Are you a mermaid? Are you a mermaid? Look. You're a mermaid. Hmm. No, I'm not. <laughs> Go we'll potty again. Go potty. Do you have to poop? Yeah. Let me know if you need me. Yeah. 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 Pahoki is good documentation suite. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, got some social media here, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, those are mainly for notifying uh, subscribers to the Gojo updates. Uh, each time we do an update, we have uh, automation that goes through and submits tweets or I don't think it's a way of saying posts, but those things. Uh, so go ahead and follow or like, subscribe, whatever they call them in those respective platforms. Uh, and finally, just some quick free takeaways, or excuse me, some takeaways. Uh, Defect Dojo is totally free. Uh, it's a risk-free forever trial. You know, we're never going to block your access or take it away. We technically can't. Um, so, you know, getting involved is of no cost to you. All it costs is your time, really, which is not too bad for a security team. Uh, community is super involved. You know, everybody loves to help one another, especially in the Slack channels. Um, love to pay it forward. And, Take advantage of it. You know, it's it's very harmonious there. Um, it very quickly recycles. So if you find something that you're not locked, you shouldn't turn it all the way, you silly girl. My me, I don't know how to do this. It's Hewlett Packard. Laser jet.
I don't know. What do you want to do when um 